Uh, my name is Audrey Wilson. I am the Community Engagement Officer at Scottish Council and Archives and welcome to our first webinar of eight on the subject of digitisation and it's all about developing your digital skills. Sean Rippington, a Digital Archivist and Copyright Manager at the University of St Andrews is giving our first presentation. Um, and he will be giving an introduction to the topic and the other ones will be a lot more specific. Uh, the presentation will last about 20 minutes and then we're going to have a dedicated Q&A session. And what I'd like you to do is to put your questions throughout the talk into the Q&A bar. You will see it at the bottom of your screen. It says Q&A and I will gather them up and I will be bringing them together and I can ask Sean um, after he's done his presentation. So these webinars are every Thursday lunchtime and I really do hope you can join us next week and for all the other ones uh, you can book through Eventbrite. So before we start just a quick note on housekeeping. This uh, webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the SCA website and I can post it on Twitter at C Archives Scott. I can put that in the chat room so you can all follow us. Um, I've also put on the closed captions that you can see at the bottom of the screen and some people will find this very useful um, as well as listening to Sean. Um, you can actually read what he is saying underneath. And I think without much ado, I am going to now pass on to Sean, who's going to share his screen. Thanks. Thank you, Audrey. If you just bear with me, yeah, I will share my screen. Can we see that okay? Uh, Great. Sorry, Zoom is um, coming up the top of my screen. Uh, there we go. Um, Sean, are you happy with the closed captions or would you like me to? Put them That's off? fine by me. Yeah. I mean, good luck to it trying to work out what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, this is just, a, as Audrey says, just a quick introduction to digitization. Uh, and then there'll be a series of similar webinars over the following weeks going into more detail. So, this is really kind of the brief overview. Um, so, I'll just start off very quickly talking about who I am, uh, why you might want to digitize, why you, why you might want to come along to an event like this. Um, we'll very quickly go through some examples of community digital uh, digitization that you might take as inspiration. Um, we'll start talking about what you might need to think about before you start, uh, including things like why are you digitizing things? Who are you doing this for? Uh, what are you going to digitize? And we'll look a little bit about things to think about for costs and resourcing. So who am I? Uh, I'm Sean, I'm the Digital Archives Manager at the University of St Andrews Libraries and Museums up in Scotland. Uh, I also enjoy working with community heritage groups in my spare time. Uh, and I've run a few training sessions with the SCA and uh, the Community Archives and Heritage Group in Scotland before. So Audrey very kindly invited me to take this session today. So firstly, definitions. What do we mean by digitization? Are we all talking about the same thing? Essentially, we're talking about taking something physical and creating a copy in a digital format. So the most obvious one might be taking a digital photo of a paper manuscript or a paper record, uh, digitally scanning a book or creating a 3D scan of an object, that, that kind of thing. Uh, technically speaking, creating a digital copy of a video or sound recording might not be digitization, um, but for the purposes of this series, we are going to include it. Um, what don't we mean? Um, so we aren't going to be talking about things that are created digitally or born digital is sometimes the phrase that you'll see and which only exist in digital form. So things like emails or Word or doc documents or PDFs, that kind of thing. Um, we also won't be looking at what you might think of as the opposite of digitization, which is taking something that is digital and turning it into something analog. So printing out a digital photo on paper or uh, 3D printing a scan. Um, though you might want to do those things. So why might you want to digitize things? Um, essentially to provide access in new ways to new people, um, to provide access to people who cannot see your heritage collection in person, um, often because the cost of operating a publicly accessible archive is quite expensive or museum or something like that. Perhaps the cost of travel to them is prohibitive or they have some sort of disability or because of a pandemic, as we've been experiencing. 
Um, you might also be doing this to try and preserve items in your collection. So you might say that a very accurate digital represent representation of an item can be very useful if the physical item subsequently gets damaged or degrades or even if you lose it. Um, you might find that providing access to a digital copy of an item rather than giving people the original uh, reduces wear and tear on the ori original item. Um, but having said all that, do, do preserve and keep up, look after your physical materials as well. Don't just rely on digitization. Um, you might digitize things so you can put them on your blog or your website. Most community heritage groups will want some kind of online presence and having some digitized material on there will make that a lot more interesting and engaging. Um, you might want to digitize things for storytelling purposes. Um, digitizing materials allows you to recombine them in new ways that you might have not been able to do before. You can bring together images and video and audio to tell new stories. Um, you may want to digitize material to crowdsource information, by which we mean sharing materials amongst a group or sometimes publicly on like Facebook or something like that, and getting people to feed back on any information they may have about it so you can learn more about your collection. Uh, digitization can also allow or enable new kinds of search. So depending on how you go about it, you may be able to use text search on a document that you digitize. You can maybe have to search by size or format or content or color. And we'll look at that later. Um, digitization may also allow you to promote or brand your organizational collection. So even if you only digitize a small amount of your collection, just having a little archive or bank of digitized materials can be really useful um, for developing things like promotional materials. Um, online teaching and engagement. So the uptake of online teaching and engagement activities, so kind of like this, has clearly gone through the roof during COVID and may well continue to be in demand. Having some digitized materials make, really makes that a lot easier. Um, you may want to sell or license your digitized material. Um, that can be a good income stream, though on the other hand, it may put people off using your digitized material. That's a little decision you'll have to make. Um, you might also want to think if you can uh, create branded goods like books and postcards. Like that. You may see it as an opportunity to as an opportunity to develop skills um, for you and your volunteers and your co-workers. Uh, it may develop skills that you can use in other parts of your life. Uh, it may enable new kinds of study. So um, it may allow people to look at your materials in new ways, zooming in closer than they could in reality, combining things from different collections in ways they couldn't before, using computers to read text, this kind of thing. You may find that digitizing materials generates interest in the original physical item or in an entire collection. So if someone sees something online, they may want to loan it for a physical ex exhibition or come and see the original in person. Um, you may find that digitized material allows you to engage with projects like Wikipedia or Europeana. Um, these are like very highly used starting points for research. So getting your digitized materials on these sites will open up your collections to new audiences and potential uses. Um, there are activities like reminiscence. You might have heard of reminiscence activities in care homes. That's kind of engaging older people by uh, looking at materials from their previous, uh, previous years of their life. And that can act as a kind of therapy. And a mix of physical and digitized materials can be a good start for that. And finally, who knows, creative uses we haven't thought of. Um, as technology develops, people will come up with new ways of using digitized heritage material, and that can be exciting also. Oh, and not quite finally, you might enjoy it. So sometimes just going through your materials and uh, studying them closely and digitizing them can be just a fun experience that you might enjoy. So I've put together a few examples of digitization by community heritage groups that might serve as inspiration. I've looked at Scottish examples uh, just because I know that a little better. I'm going to do this by resharing my screen and looking at them online. So if you bear with me, I will do that now. Can we see that all right, Audrey? Yes. Yes. I can see it. yes. So this is uh, Stowe Parish Archive. So this is, uh, they've essentially created an online uh, repository of images from Stowe uh, with little descriptions that you can search and dates and reference numbers. And this is like fairly straightforward, but you can see a lot of work has gone into it. And um, they've identified people in photographs. Um, so I'd say this is like fairly sophisticated for a community heritage group. And this is really a good um, research starting point. Um, I'm also taking a look here at 
Glasgow Women's Library. So they create kind of like online exhibitions or blogs of digitized material. Um, I really like this one about postcards and fighting for women's suffrage. So they've digitized a series of postcards from their collection and put together a bit of text to tell a narrative about that collection. And it's not everything from that collection, it's just kind of selected highlights. Um, I also liked this uh, Spirit of Revolt archive from Glasgow, which is kind of an archive of uh, radical, radical politics. They have this thing called the uh, Read of the Month, where every month they digitize a new publication and create a kind of online reading group. Um, they host their digitized material on something called the Internet Archive, which has a, a viewer for publications, uh, and they offer a certain amount of free storage for community groups. That's another idea you could think about. Um, I also like Colourful Heritage in Glasgow. This is a, an archive of um, people of Southeast Asian heritage in Scotland. They've created a kind of mixed media um, timeline, I guess is what you'd call it. And they've brought together digitized materials, um, named individuals, dates, and created a kind of narrative out of their digitized collections. Um, I also like Time Spam. Uh, this is, uh, I can't remember where it's based, but it is in Scotland. Helmsdale by the looks of it. And um, they've created a kind of online exhibition of digitized physical objects, so like museum type objects. Uh, and if you click on them, you get a kind of closer view and you get a little audio recording that's relating to the object and you also get a little bit of kind of text explaining what it is. So I like that as well. Um, this one is Hebridean Connections. This is quite similar to um, the first one we looked at. It's essentially a kind of uh, online archive of images, uh, descriptions, IDs and you can click through and take a look at what they've digitized and you get a little copyright notice uh, and that's a good research starting point as well. And here we've got Europeana that I mentioned earlier so this is a kind of content, content uh, aggregator for Europe, for European digitized heritage. Um, the Trade Union Commission have used it, so Trade Union Congress Library have used it to upload and host their digitized poster collection. Um, so this is something you might want to explore. What I like about this, oh, excuse me, um, that it has, uh, it allows you to share, download, it has some additional contextual information and it also allows you to search by color. So if you were to click on any of these colors, it would search through the collection for items of a similar color, which I kind of think is kind of an interesting idea. Uh, and finally, uh, I like this example of uh, Wiki Loves Monuments. So this is images from Wikimedia that people have uploaded and it maps them onto a map of Glasgow. So you can kind of see different heritage sites in Glasgow that people have digitized. So that was just a brief, um, idea of a few uh, potential inspirations for you there. So I'll stop sharing and I will go back to my slides. Um, I should say I'm going to share these slides at the end. So I've got all the URLs what I've just looked at and you'll be able to click through and uh, look at those at your leisure. So having had a bit of inspiration and thought about why we might be doing this, um, what do we need to think about before we digitized. I think I've broken this up into four sections. Why are you digitizing things? Who are you digitizing for? What are you going to digitize? And a little bit about costs and resourcing. So why are you digitizing things? Well, you might want to take a different approach depending on whether you are digitizing to provide access to information. So a bit like those digitized um, spirit of revolt reading list kind of things where perhaps the access to the information is more important than creating a really detailed replica or reproduction of an item. On the other hand, you might be trying to preserve the highest quality copy of you can for preservation purposes. Um, you might be preserving things for a particular project like a timeline or a social media page. Uh, you may be producing or digitizing things for a particular user or group of users, for example, people with a disability. So you're gonna have to do a bit of, a bit of thought about what, why exactly you're doing this and how it relates to what, um, what methods you might then take to your digitization. Gonna have to think about who you are digitizing it for. Do you have a specific audience in mind? Can you do a little bit of audience research to find out what they want to see, uh, how they need it? Do you have any information about material that is commonly requested so you can kind of start prioritizing? 
And finally, uh, also, what are you going to digitize? So you need to think about uh, are there things I definitely do want to digitize? Are there things I definitely don't want to digitize? Can I start prioritizing things? Um, are there multiple versions? Do I need to digitize all of them or only one? Um, if there's more than one version of a photograph, is it just okay to digitize one of them, for example? Um, does it matter if I only digitize part of the collection? So if I do one letter from a bundle of letters, is that okay? Or do I need to do all of them? Uh, is the context important? Um, will somebody else digitize it if I don't? Or is it something that's unique to us? Um, would I be happy to let someone digitize it? Or do I really want to do it? Uh, what is its physical condition? Is it going to need some cleaning or flattening or some conservation work? Uh, is it likely to be damaged by the digitization process? Um, does it matter if I have more than one copy of something? I might not mind if one copy gets uh, a bit mangled in a scanner or something like that, but there might be other objects where I really do mind. And I'll have to think about how I approach that. Um, is it going to be too expensive for me to keep the digital copy? So um, will the files that I produce require a lot of storage space? Um, that's particularly a concern for audio and video content, which can create really big digital files. Um, do I know what it is? Uh, am I likely to be able to work it out? Does it matter if I don't know what it is? Um, can I create little catalog entries like we saw in some of those websites, or am I trying to crowdsource information? Um, can I put names to faces in photographs, this kind of thing? Uh, can I keep track of all of this? Do my collection items have names or reference numbers that I can use? Um, digitization is likely to involve moving things around. Uh, so you're going to have to have some sort of tracking system in place to make sure you're not losing or misplacing things. Um, is it already published elsewhere? So particularly for um, book type publications, it's very likely that it may already be online, in which case you probably don't need to digitize it. Um, do you own the item? Uh, is it on loan to you or on deposit to you? Um, would it be sensible to ask the owner's permission if you don't own it? Um, if there's something you want to digitize and you don't have it, can you can you loan it in or can you ask permission of someone who does own it to bring it in? Um, does what you want to digitize contain personal sensitive information relating to living people? Uh, can you comply with data protection rules around personal data? So that's things like uh, any information that would identify a living individual such as the name, address, email or some photographs. So, that could be quite an important thing if you're digitizing, say, uh, contemporary correspondence. Um, does what I want to digitize contain copyright material? Do I know who owns the copyright and how long it lasts? Um, so as a kind of high level warning, I'd be wary of digitizing and putting online any commercial or financially valuable works where you do not have the rights or have the permission to publish it. So things like commercial photography or uh, films, this kind of thing, or audio recordings. Um, are there any ethical concerns um, or some other reasons to be cautious? Are you talking about sacred items or items relating to complex or thorny issues that might be controversial? Uh, are you working with material that belongs or comes from other cultures? You might need to think twice about how you go about digitizing that and who you work with and what kind of permissions you seek. Um, finally, cost and resourcing. So, whether, whatever approach you take to digitization, there will be some resource implications. So as a starting point, you certainly want to have some kind of inventory or catalog of what you want to digitize. So you have at least a basic knowledge of what you're talking about here in terms of scale. So you can use that information to plan forward. Um, you might consider a trial run of a limited number of items just to get some idea of cost. Um, if you are going to take the time to review your items for copyright or data protection or ethical concerns, um, you need to factor in some time for that and potentially any relevant training you or your colleagues may need to do that review. Um, technically speaking, you're gonna need some equipment to do this. So you'll find out more about this in the subsequent uh, sessions, but you may need to buy or borrow some equipment and you may in turn need some training or support to actually use it. So that's another cost. You need to make sure that you have a suitable workspace. So you have a large, large enough, clean, manageable, secure workspace of good lighting. Those can sometimes be hard to find. Uh, if your process means that you have to store your items in your workspace for a period of time, um, is that okay? Is it, is it safe? Is it secure? Um, do you have a plan for moving collections items to and from your workspace if you need to do that? Do you have the right sort of boxes and transport? 
You also need to factor in processing time. So digitization is not just a matter of taking pictures or scanning things. You may also need to name files, store them in a logical way. You might want to do some sort of editing or cropping, reorienting, reordering them, and deleting them from your camera, this kind of thing. So that all takes a little bit of time and may need a little bit of extra tools and training too. Um, if you're hoping to put your material online, um, you'll have to think about how you're going to do that. Um, a lot of website, you can obviously create a website fairly easy now, but a lot of the hosting fees are tied to the amount of storage space you need, so you'll need to think about that. Um, if you're using volunteers or staff, you'll need to think about training them, uh, maybe doing some sort of drawing some diagrams or workflow notes so everyone agrees and understands what they're doing. That takes a little bit of time. If you're outsourcing some work, so say you're getting some films digitized and you can't do it, so you found a firm who can do that for you, um, you need to spend a little bit of time looking at the contracts and working out how the delivery is going to work and who's going to be doing, who's in, ensuring all of this and this kind of thing. Um, you need to spend some time doing some QA, some quality assurance, basically checking everything. Um, that can take a long time. Um, having some means for people to provide user feedback can be useful. So you may need to set up an email address or some kind of social media account so people can tell you if what you're digitizing is useful or if they're enjoying it or if they want to use it, this kind of thing. You might also want to spend some time putting together a takedown notice. So that's a, a, a little notice saying we will we will take down this digitized item if you have some good reason to complain about it, like you are the copyright holder or you think it's insensitive or this kind of thing. Um, so again, you need, might need to spend a little time doing that. So that was a very quick one through the slides. Um, like I say, you will get these for your reference. Um, I have put together some further reading. I think these went out already in the invite, but these are little, quite good overviews of digitization that might be worth looking at. Um, I know copyright can be a concern, so I've put together a list of resources. This is admittedly UK focused. I didn't realize we had an international audience today, so this is less applicable to people outside of the UK, um, but there might still be some good guidance in there. Um, I've also linked to Naomi, Naomi Korn's website, which has a ton of good information about managing uh, copyright and intellectual property, uh, and a few other case studies there. And I've also put together some kind of reading list about data protection, which I, again, I know can be a concern for people. Uh, again, this is UK focused, um, but I think it will be a good starting point for everyone. Anyway. And that's the end, so I will stop sharing. And that was about 20 minutes, wasn't it? I'll hand back to you, Audrey, and maybe we can take some questions. Yes, thank you very much. No, I know it is very rapid. Um, and I do want to say that I did send out um, some links, um, but I think Sean, you've given us some more there and I will um, go through them. And after the presentation today, I will be emailing you all with a feedback form, which would be fantastic if you can complete it um, and let us know what we're doing right and what we're not doing right, but what you would like more of. Um, and we will be very happy to provide that training. And I will also send at that point the additional links that Sean has sent. Sean, are you happy for people maybe to contact you? Or have you got a preferred email address? Uh, yeah, I'll put an email address in the chat. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Sorry, I wasn't able to look at the comments as I was talking, so I haven't been following. No. Do not worry, do not worry. Um, and I do want to also mention to people that sometimes the closed captions can be a little bit interesting what they come up with. Um, they're not very good at technical terms and they're not very good with uh, a Scottish accent either sometimes. Uh. Um, but I will just run through um, the, the chat room. I think everyone's using the chat room, um, which is uh, absolutely fine for their questions. Um, and I sort of did, uh, I did ask if anyone was already sharing their collections on some sort of digital platform, mm -hmm. because that would be interesting. And uh, uh, apparently Inverclyde Heritage Network are, long, are launching a website with a blog on the 4th of May. So I was just asking if other people could upload images to that, um, because that, that could be really quite interesting. So this is a question from Paula Yimga. And it is, do the physical materials and their digital copy have the same, no, their digital copy have the same copyright? Photographs, for example. Um, 
that can be a thorny issue. So that, I'm, I'm talking about the UK jurisdiction here, so it may be slightly different depending on where you are. Um, generally, I, th I think as a rule of thumb, I would say if the original is out of copyright, I would treat any digitized version as also out of copyright. Some organizations do say that if they are creating a digital copy of an out of copyright work, that they will assert copyright over their new, um, new creation, as they would put it. Um, so that's an issue. Um, generally speaking, also, if there is existing copyright in what you want to digitize, you should assume that you need uh, either, well, either the permission of the person who owns the copyright, uh, or you take a risk and digitize it anyway, which might be appropriate if you're digitizing only a small amount or something that's non-commercial. Um, though I would take a look at the guidance that I had there at the end that will go through some of that in more detail. Um, does that help? I think that does help actually. Um, I'm just going on to see if um, Paul has, I don't know if it's, I think it's Paul because it's got an E at the end, so I'm assuming it's not Paula, but please uh, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, there is another question here uh, from Walter, and he just asks, is there a risk that future technology will not be compatible? Yes, um, that is a risk. So there are ways of mitigating against that. So that's trying to keep things simple and documented and using uh, commonly used open standards and technologies. So we have a later um, session in this series called, I think it's called Digital Sustainability. And that will talk about some of the issues you're thinking about there. So like trying not to create images in uh, unusual formats or creating websites that are super complicated or 3D scans that require specific bits of technology to work, that kind of thing. Um, so that's a, that you're, you're absolutely right, it's a big topic, and I think we will have a whole session on that later on. Yes, I was going to do, um, I think uh, what's been highlighted to us especially is um, collections that are of film and sound. Uh, so tape recordings um, are a big thing, cassette players, DVD, CD, ROMs, all of these things. Um, but I'm sure Maya will be um, touching on that in uh, her webinar, which is in a, a few weeks time. Um, I am just seeing, ah, so one question is, it's one you may hear a lot actually, Sean, is, is digitization the same as digital archiving? Um, I would say they're separate but related. So I, I would think of digitization as just the act of taking something that exists physically and making a digital copy. That was kind of the definition we used there. Digital archiving, I think of as the whole process of gathering together digital stuff and managing it over time, um, preserving it, making it available, uh, gathering information about it, um, licensing it, backing it up, this kind of thing. So I would think of digital archiving as being a sort of more complicated process about how you manage that over time. Is that the kind of definition I would use? Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to answer Andrew Roger here. Um, he's not getting to see the chat or questions. I am, um, I'm recording this session. I'm not sure if the chat will come up in that actually, Andrew, uh, but just while you're here, maybe I'm hoping you're seeing at the bottom of your screen, you have got some icons and that's where you will see chat with a little box it's like a little speech bubble and you've also got q a which is like two speech bubbles um try clicking on them um so you can join the chat um otherwise uh most of what's being said will be included because i am asking people questions and that's being recorded so hopefully that will help um i'm going into the q a because we have another question. Do you have a virtual workshop or internship for new coming international archivists like me from Aegith? Where Aegith is coming from? Um, Sean, I don't really know if you can answer that because I don't think we do have, we definitely don't have an internship, I'm afraid, um, Aegith, but there is a um, maybe somewhere Sean that you can think of that Aegis sh should look to and um yes we can have a think about that and put something together I guess a lot of these things will have been closed over the last year for obvious reasons so the information may not be up to date but I think we'd have to go away and see if we can put something okay. together um something that might be of interest perhaps is to look at the digital preservation coalition website perhaps 
Um, that's very much an international uh, digital platform and they do run different courses, but it might be an opportunity to network as well, which I think would be very useful for you um, as well, Edith. And I'm just keeping an eye. Thank you for putting in that. Um, I'm not seeing any... Uh, I'm just going to read out to Leslie Ellis who says, we have a digital archive and we use our own database. Do you have any recommendations on particular software that might aid the process? Um, I'd hesitate to recommend something right now. If, if you send me an email, um, we could talk a bit more about what your resources are and what exactly you're trying to do. And we could maybe put together a few ideas. Uh, I think also if you keep going to these sessions over the next few weeks, you'll see some ideas suggested, I expect. So you, you'll come up with some ideas that way. Um, but yeah. it's, like, it's like I say, it's hard to recommend because it really does depend on exactly what you're trying to do and what your resources yeah. are. Ah, so um, Una has also got some questions uh, regarding software. I think Sean's right. I think uh, the digitization of different materials requires different software. So that will be covered by the individual presentations later on. So next Thursday, for instance, um, Paula Larkin will be focusing on photographs and documents. And then the following week, we'll be looking at film and sound. And then we actually have one on objects, so 3D digitization. So all of them will require different types of software. So please sign up. I think there are still places available on all of those webinars and you can do it on Eventbrite. All of them start with developing your digital skills and then they have the specialist topic that they're dealing with. So I am not seeing any more. Oh, oh, I don't know if you can see that. Um, Ajith has come back and asked for software digitization. What should I look for? Again, what do you think? Anything, Sean, or do you think we should just... Uh, again, yeah, I would say, like you say, if you go to each of the following sessions where people will go through a different kind of digitization, I'm sure they'll have some ideas. Uh, like we say, it depends what you're trying to digitize and what your uh, budget and resources are, but I, I think they're more likely to have specific ideas for what you want to look at. Yeah. Um, someone has come up, Vincent Mutula has come up to say, yes, I can recommend some um, software. I'm going to say to you, Vincent, if you want to, um, you should share that with all the attendees, if you can do that on the chat room. Um, I think that's easier for you to give out your email address than me. So if you could pop that in the chat room, that would be brilliant. So I'm just quickly looking through... Um, in case I've missed any other questions. Um, and I'm not seeing anything at the moment. So, oh, can you see, Sean, can you oh, see the sorry. q &A? Um, Just, just, it's, that's just from Aegis again. It's about Google coding. Um, I'm not sure, Edith. I think I might recommend that you give um, you contact Sean because that could be quite a lengthy discussion. Uh, yes. Yes, I'm not sure about that one. So if you kind of put a long form email together. We'll... Yeah, and you will all have got Sean's email address in the chat room. I hope. That's yeah. fantastic. So no, I'm not seeing anything else. So if there are no more questions, I just want to make sure I may say goodbye to everyone. Let's just do one last check. Great. And you can always contact me um, at a.wilson at scottisharchives.org.uk. Um, if you do have any other questions, and I will very happily um, answer them if I can, or I will pass on your details to Sean or someone else um, who's speaking as part of this webinar series. That is great. But that's uh, otherwise, I think we have 
answered everything, Sean. So just I'd like to say thank you very much for giving up part of your lunchtime. I hope you've still got time to grab a sandwich and a cup yeah. of tea. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for coming along as well. Um, yep. Yeah, I know that was a very quick one. Um, that's just the nature of these, isn't it? So um, we'll share those slides and it's probably easy to go through them at your leisure and kind of pick out the bits that are interesting. For you. Absolutely. And I will be handing out the additional links as well. So there'll be lots of information going out to people. But thank you very much for coming along to our first, um, our first webinar. And I very much look forward to seeing some of you at our others. All right. Bye.